Uh, welcome to the full 360. My name is Eric Chang. I'm head of immersive media in the Oculus Experiences team. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the best, best practices for 360 video for content creators and developers. This is going to be an overview of the current state of 360 video, including information about cameras, post-processing, uh, distribution via Facebook, Oculus Video, and VR apps. Um, we're not going to talk too much about integration of 360 video into game engines, but rather we'll focus on creating 360 video for VR headset experiences. So virtual reality has historical roots in gaming and interactive experiences in CG worlds. And 360 video content has been possible for years, mostly using do-it-yourself camera rigs and custom post-processing workflows. But new integrated 360 cameras and workflow tools are allowing more and more content developers to capture and use 360 video at a high enough quality for headset-based VR experiences. So we're going to split the talk into two parts. Uh, the first is uh, about 360 cameras and workflow distribution. And part two will be a deep dive into the making of MUBI, which is one of the highest quality 360 video experiences ever made. We're very honored to have Paul Raphael and Ryan Horrigan from Felix and Paul Studios here to talk about how they did it. Now, to get a sense of where people can see and experience 360 video, let's talk about the distribution surfaces in the Facebook ecosystem. So by di distribution surfaces, I mean the different endpoints for 360 video. So these are the places where an audience can experience this kind of immersive form of media. The first is the Facebook news feed. Now, Facebook supports 360 video in, in web browsers and in the mobile app. In browsers, users use the mouse to click and drag around. On new mobile devices, users can drag with their finger, or they can rotate the device around to view content in what's called a magic window. So obviously, this surface has the largest number of users. Uh, and while there are minimum requirements for hardware and software, it's more or less a democratized method for viewing and interacting with 360 content. So the, the, this content is uploaded to and streams from Facebook. Now, 360 video starts to come alive in headset, and 360 content is popular in mobile headsets like Gear VR. Oculus Video is a Gear VR experience. It's full of curated 360 video content. The Facebook 360 app is feed-based, so this pulls 360 content from the greater Facebook video ecosystem. Now, 360 video can also be embedded for local playback in bespoke VR experiences. MUBI is a great example of this by Felix and Paul, and other apps like the New York Times VR app are collections of all of their 360 video work. Now, 360, of course, also exists in desktop VR experiences via the Oculus Rift. The Rift has a similar 360 video experience as does the Gear VR, but it's also very frequently used to play back local 360 media stored on your file system. We use this a ton for development, for example. Now, let's talk a little bit about the 360 video format. Some of you may have, first of all, how many folks in the audience have made 360 video? A very large number. How many have not but want to? Okay, one. <laughs> um, so 360 videos, you all know, are shared, typically shared in equirectangular projection. If you're not familiar with this projection, it's one of the typical projections you see used in maps around the world. It basically allows you to represent a sphere uh, using a plane. Um, so in, in a mono content, this is just a single video stream. This is what it looks like. This is a screen grab from a video of the recent total solar eclipse in Oregon. So this is equirectangular projection as standard video. Now in stereo, things get a little more interesting. Stereo 360 video is rec also represented using a rectangular projection. And a stereo pair, that would be a left eye and a right eye, is called an omni-stereo panorama. Now this, has, it, this is fantastic because it does allow stereo representation using a standard video format. But it does have a couple things that, that you need to know about. The first is that the rotation of the two eyes is around one axis. So it's, if your eyes were in the center of your head, that's how you'd be looking at the world. And IPD, you know, the interpupillary distance, is, is correct if you look straight, but it converges to zero as you look up and down. So if you look at experiences that, for example, were rendered in CG and converted to video, when you look up, you'll see the world sort of flatten into a plane above your head. Likewise, if you look down, you lose video, uh, you lose stereo. So one way to think about this is that if you draw a plane out of your right eye 
and a plane out of your left eye, and these two planes converge at the middle of your head, if you look up, those two planes will intersect to zero, and that's effectively what's happening. And what this allows you to do is, is use video as a transport mechanism. Otherwise, you'd have this problem that if you looked up and then you turned your head, you would lose the stereo effect. All right, so let's talk about the state of 360 cameras. So this is a plot of currently available integrated 360 cameras that shoot at 4K or greater in resolution. So along the x-axis, we have price increasing to the right, and on the y-axis, we have output resolution. Now, stereo cameras are shown in orange. I've also done a rough classification of consumer, prosumer, and professional cameras. And this is always very hard to do because in practice, people use whatever camera works well for them. So consumer cameras, for example, are frequently used in professional productions. I'm gonna go into each one of these in greater detail. So on the consumer front, here are the, here's a list of some of the cameras that are available. Just this year, consumer 360 cameras are finally able to capture beyond 4K at 30 frames per second. Prices in this range from around $170 to $800, and uh, three of these cameras shown here output pr fairly high quality video at 5.2 to 5.7K. And two of them, the Yi and the Garmin, can also stitch in camera at 4K and actually can also stream out to Facebook Live. Prosumer cameras uh, in this list range from around $700 to $3,500. Now they, they're improving dramatically in two areas. One is image quality, that's an obvious one. But the second is stereo capture. And so we have cameras like, um, like the Zcam S1 in the middle. Uh, this shoots at 6K, 30 frames per second. It's around $2,000. This has become a workhorse in the 360 video industry for mono capture. On the right, far right there, you see the Insta360 Pro. This was the first integrated stereo or 3D 360 camera to be released at around $3,500 with internal stitching to 3D. So this was a camera that significantly reduced the entry point for shooting in stereo, which was a very complex process before. And, and often still is in the high end. So on the professional front, there is huge diversity in, in 360 cameras. In this category, prices now range from around $2,000 to $30,000, and there are significant differences in things like light sensitivity, stitching quality, post-processing workflow, broadcast friendliness. Uh, there's too much here to go into great detail right now, but we're finally starting to see cameras that shoot in stereo 3D out of the box at a quality comparable to what we would expect out of a large budget production even a year ago. So this is a, a, a very fast moving hardware landscape with some brands that might be unfamiliar to those of you who are interested in photography. Of course they are DIY cameras. Now these are, this is from Radiant Images, one of their head rigs. But these, these custom rigs are still very commonly in use, especially in the high end. So what's great about DIY cameras is that, is that they're extremely versatile. They can essentially be configured to target a specific resolution, overlap percentage, dynamic range, um, whatever shooting scenario that you're, you're targeting. Also, integrated 360 cameras are often behind in image quality per sensor. You know, in a DOI camera, you can choose the sensors and the lenses that you're using uh, for your needs. And finally, the individual camera outputs uh, can be used based on production needs. So, for example, if you need uh, a particular kind of preview or live stream on set, um, you can use a uh, very easily configured DOI camera for that. So I want to talk more about 3D 360 cameras. Um, these are essentially the three kinds of cameras we're seeing right now. The first is based on stereo pairs. The second, optical flow. And the third is depth-based. So in the stereo scenario, this is an iZuger camera rig that uses modified GoPro cameras. Um, the cameras are arranged in left eye pairs. You can see that in, in this picture. And this one uses six cameras. And three of those would be left eye cameras, and three would be right eye cameras. And the stitchers know how to take these tagged cameras, left and right eye, and, and stitch them uh, using, essentially just using geometry. And um, 
this can be very effective, but if the camera sensors and lenses are, very, are not precisely placed and calibrated, it can result in poor stereo. And the output is um, a standard omni-stereo panorama. On the optical flow side, now these rigs are, you mostly see them as being cylindrical in nature. They're designed to have a large amount of overlap. And th these are computational imaging cameras. So features and pixels are computationally tracked across cameras. And what we're doing is, in, in these cameras, is generating stereo via novel view synthesis using a virtual IPD. So you're not, the cameras are not arranged using a specific IPD that matches humans. They're arranged for maximum overlap. And in, in, uh, in the stitching process, uh, virtual cameras are being placed for each of those eyes as you look around. So that's how uh, optical flow cameras are done. And in theory, this allows for parallax error correction. So if you've stitched using stereo rigs, very commonly, you have to specify the, the stitching distance, and it's very common to go back and stitch at multiple distances and to rotoscope in uh, to fix stitching problems. Um, but in theory, optical, optical flow cameras can fix uh, parallax errors. One potential downside is that it's very computationally intensive. So stitching using optical flow takes a lot longer than other, the, the stereo pair-based stitching. And the output is also an omni-stereo panorama. But what's interesting is you're also able to do depth estimation to get a limited depth map. Like we're already starting to see these from shipping cameras, integrated cameras that, that are uh, not DIY in nature. Um, this is a, a Zcam V1 Pro. Um, the Facebook Surround 360 Open Edition, which is open source and open hardware, use, has an optical flow stitcher. And that technology has made it into the current best of class integrated cameras like the Zcam V1 Pro, also the Kandao Obsidian. So both Zcam and Kandao are showing depth maps from their cameras right now. And they're very collaborative with the community. So if you go on, uh, there's a Facebook VR 360 professionals group. All of this stuff gets posted there uh, virtually the day it's developed. Finally, we have depth-based cameras. Now, these cameras output depth in all directions. I say cameras, but it's really the whole system designed around the camera, the software the ecosystem. And there are a few approaches to this, this kind of camera. The first is passive estimation. So this relies on camera calibration and spatial oversampling. So every point in space can be seen by, by multiple cameras. It's essentially a photogrammetry-like solve. So you're determining depth by, by, uh, by geometry from, from uh, multiple cameras. The Facebook X24 prototype camera is, is this kind of camera using passive depth estimation. And we're also seeing active capture approaches. And this is a sensor fusion approach. So this is RGB capture, so color capture, plus some kind of separate active scanning capture. And those two, uh, two or more um, uh, data sets are merged in post. And the third is the mach machine learning approach. Facebook at F8 showed uh, depth being, being a, a output from single 2D images using machine learning. Um, this is a really exciting area. We haven't seen this much in the 360 world yet, um, but it seems like it's inevitable. So what is the bar for high quality stereo 360 video? This is a really hard question uh, to answer theoretically. And one reason is that output resolution and cameras the, by specification don't actually mean that much. You know, that there's not exactly a, a, a tie-in to actual resolving power or quality. Um, but a general uh, guideline is that we're looking for a high quality 4K mono or 4K per eye. On the mono side, this is getting much easier. You know, we're seeing some small cameras even uh, capable of outputting uh, video that looks fairly good in headset. Um, this is, this is a, actually quite new. Um, on the stereo and high, higher end side, it's, it's still fairly difficult and expensive, but it's moving very quickly. These integrated cameras are being used by a ton of independent developers and student, uh, student groups um, because they're much more accessible in price. So let's talk about two different kinds of 360 video experiences that we're seeing in headset. Um, the first I've, I've called documentary or raw. Um, in this category, very little post-production is needed. It's more about uh, uh, telepresence 
and storytelling by allowing someone to explore a space with perhaps a, a light narrative running through it. So a small team or an individual with the right skill set can create, create very, experiences, uh, very interesting experiences in this field. I think I keep using Miobi as an example because it's an example of a creative or a, an interactive project with, with a very uh, well thought out narrative, um, a script and actors. And um, these things I think can be done by smaller production houses, but in practice we're seeing mostly uh, higher end and bigger budget productions succeeding in this space. Okay, so let's talk about workflow a little bit. Um, this is the, the same basic workflow that, that we use for traditional video, essentially capture, edit, distribute. It's pretty simple. Um, on the capture side, we're, there are some other things to think about. Camera stability, considered motion. Motion, um, Colin brought this up in his talk yesterday about storytelling, but you know, there used to be this idea that you couldn't move the camera. We're starting to see a lot of people move the camera. Um, but I think what's important in this area is, is testing. You know, there's really, it's very hard to know how someone will react in headset to a camera move unless you put someone in headset and show them the content. So, um, you know, he had this theme in his talk as well, but we very much encourage people to shoot and test as, as a fundamental part of the, the flow. Uh, live monitoring, uh, spatial audio, these are all big categories that have their own talks at this conference. Um, and so, I, well, actually, this, the spatial audio talk is right now, so if you're interested, <laughs> you might want to go. Um, uh, and plate and scene capture. So, um, you know, often there are tripods, dollies, other things in the way. Um, on the editing side, um, we have proxy stitching. This would be so you can actually look at your 360 video. Most of these high-end cameras do not output uh, stitched, uh, stitched 360 video, so it can be hard to look at video in real time or even right after you've shot. Um, followed by an edit. High quality stitch with VFX layering, spatial audio, mastering and distribution. So these are pretty standard workflows. There, there hasn't been a lot uh, changed here from a standard workflow. But I want to talk about stitching. So there are some generic stitching tools out there. These would be tools that are essentially dedicated stitchers that are bundled with other tools that are useful in the 360 video ecosystem. These would be tools like Colors, Autopano Pro, uh, Autopano Video, and Mystica VR. Um, there are also more general tools that are used very often, like Foundry Nuke. These are used in 360 all the time. Um, but what's really interesting that, that, uh, is that in the last year, these integrated 360 cameras are almost all shipping with their own stitching tools. And these, are, these tools are camera specific. They're all, they also leverage calibration data. So, you know, because the manufacturer owns the whole workflow through stitching, they're able to use this calibration data to help tune this stitch. So uh, that's great because we're seeing some very good stitches out of the box from these cameras. However, it can be less flexible. Uh, the stitcher does what the stitcher is going to do, and if you need to go back and tune the stitch or change things, it can often be a, a more difficult process. Okay, on the audio side, again, there's a, there, there's a dedicated talk about this. If you're interested, I'd recommend watching that after. Um, but there's a question of recording versus des designing. I've seen small productions, especially, again, from students uh, buying things like the Zoom H2N, which is less than $200 and records spatial audio. Some cameras are now recording spatial audio uh, along with the video. Um, but in practice, I think most productions are designing spatial audio. You know, we're seeing more and more tools that allow you to place objects spatially within the 360 sphere um, and even you know, track them uh, as they move around. Uh, so that's going, this is a really interesting space. Uh, Facebook has uh, the Spatial Workstation, which is a free download. Um, and this can be used to design, both design and encode uh, spatial audio for this, the Facebook ecosystem. So remember we talked about these distribution services for 360 video. These essentially fall into two categories, streaming and embedding. It's the same for traditional video. Um, but I want to talk about uploading to Facebook. So Facebook does ingest both mono and 360 stereo video. If it has the right metadata tags, you can upload them. They will be treated like 360 video. When you do this, this video becomes available on Facebook, on the web, also in the mobile app. 
but it's also available in headset through these two experiences that I mentioned before. This is the Facebook 360 Gear VR experience, also the Oculus video experience in both Gear VR and in Rift. So obviously, you have very large reach by uploading this way and distributing this way. Um, at the moment, we're talking about linear content. So this would be a traditional video stream that starts, runs through, and ends. And if you're interested in this, there is a, the, an Oculus partner publishing guide. This is the URL, the short URL. You can take pictures. And the second approach is embedding. So this is, uh, I think, a lot of what with this audience and this, uh, we're talking about this conference. This is integrating 360 video into bespoke VR experiences. Now, this requires a custom 360 player. You have to roll your own. There are some in the various uh, um, app stores out there that you can use. Um, and they support streaming and or local playback. And what's really great about this particular method is that higher quality experiences are possible because it's up, it's up to you to come up with the presentation layer. And we're seeing things like mixing video and static plates to get around decoder limitations. Decoders are one of the biggest limiting factors in 360 video because your device usually can only decode something like 4K. We're wrapping 4K around the whole sphere so you're getting a reduced resolution at any given field of view. And of course you can incorporate interactivity layers and push beyond linear storytelling, which I think is something that a lot of people are experimenting with. And we'd certainly love to see a lot more experimentation in this area. So looking forward a little bit, we are seeing a lot of activity in using depth in video. Um, this is an example of some Sixtoff movements and a point cloud from video captured with the Facebook X24 prototype uh, at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, so this is the, this depth-based approach I was talking about. Um, in this approach, stereo views are rendered during playback. Um, they can also be burned out or baked out if you're interested in, in producing video from this method. Um, but I think there's tremendous potential in increased interactivity and immersion in this area. Um, the first is that there's full 3DOF support. And we talk about stereo 360 as being 3DOF. But if you look at a stereo 360 experiences, one of those axes is taken up by stereo, by stereo. So you can't roll your heads and still see in 3D in stereoscopic video. Um, also, there's very limited sixth off possible, some amount of movement. Um, there's a head and neck model. I think this is really interesting. Actually, Mubi uses this to great effect with CG elements. There's motion parallax when you move your head because we don't rotate around you know, the, the center point between our eyes. There's also stereo at the poles. This is one of the most striking differences I've seen when looking at this kind of content. Uh, I'm used to looking down and not, not having a sense of stereo, looking up, the same thing. Um, if you have any kind of video that, where you're standing on a ledge, if you look over, you will not have this effect of, of giving someone a feeling of heights or vertigo um, unless we solve this problem. And finally, I think one thing that, uh, that is a trap for folks who are tied or have been working in linear video for a long time um, is that they don't think of video as being data. And I'm thinking of video and depth as being data. It's raw data for creatives to sculpt into some, something uh, that, that can be beyond video. Um, so this kind of depth data is really interesting. It can be used uh, so that interactive CG elements can can you know, know where objects are in the resulting video and not collide or overlap. Um, there's a huge amount of potential here. And finally, there's this volumetric or sixth off idea or dream that everybody is driving towards. So this would be room scale or beyond video experiences. Um, it's often paired up with the term holodeck or metaverse. Everyone's sort of talking about this, this push towards uh, video that allows you to move amongst the various layers. So I, I want to close this part with an idea of a paradigm shift that we're seeing. Um, I, I think we're just starting to see efforts in this, in this but it's, it's sort of the traditional video, you know, linear storytelling video, and then there are these experiences that are using 360 video as, an idea, as a data source. 
And so I think what I'd love to leave you with is the idea that video doesn't just have to be video. You know, we've seen a lot of video that gets produced and distributed using the, the current or old ways of video distribution. But I'd like to think of 360 video as being more a part of experiences instead of, instead of being films. And that's not to say that films are not useful. They're still extremely powerful. Um, but we're in this new medium in headset where, where users are, can have the possibility of much more agency. So it's a very new language, and I encourage you to be bold and to experiment. Okay, so now we're going to switch to the second part. Um, we have Paul Raphael, co-founder and creative director of Felix and Paul Studios, and also Ryan Horgan, chief content officer at Felix and Paul Studios. We'll start with a, a trailer of Mubi, and then we'll bring them up. take more trips to Japan, right, buddy? You just like those massages. Hello? We're capturing this on video, honey. My name is Dennis. 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 Say Dennis. Dennis! You said my name! I certainly did, did buddy. Did I just say that? Oh, crap. No, we got a line. Oh, get the direction. Daddy? It's okay, I'll get the direction. <laughs> Please welcome Paul and Ryan. Thanks so much for being here. So it's always funny for me to watch a 2D trailer of a headset experience because it's such a small part of, of the experience. How many of you have actually watched Mubi in headset? Okay, great. So now you have, you have some homework if you haven't watched it. Uh, it's really fantastic. So first of all, thank, thanks for being here. Congrats for all the accolades you received recently. Uh, there was an Emmy Award for the People's House. Super exciting. Um, I was, uh, so I'm a child of the 80s, and Mubi is very much evocative of a lot of the feelings I had then. Uh, it was a little bit different because I grew up in an Asian immigrant family, so I had you know, some translating to do. Um, Technically, Mubi is an Asian immigrant, too. Yeah, so. that's true. Okay, that is, <laughs> that is true. I didn't think of that. <laughs> um, but I, I'm really interested in, in this idea of, of using a robot's perspective, because what I was really struck by was that the robot is essentially treated as, as a, a, it's almost like a passive observer in the family. It's, people interact around it, and a few people sort of approach the robot and talk to it, Mubi. Um, but I didn't feel like I was a passive observer, and it's really interesting to get your, your take on, on how that happened. Yeah, I mean, that was actually the foundation of, of this whole project is, you know, how do we, you know, we've done a lot of uh, um, doc uh, documentary uh, VR experiences where essentially the viewer is usually themselves. They're, they're experiencing what we're, we're showing them. In the case of uh, this first, uh, you know, uh, large scale uh, fiction project, we really wanted the viewer to be a part of the story, but we didn't want the viewer to be themselves. We wanted them to have, um, to, 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 to have clear characteristics and if they were going to be a human, just all sorts of problems that come with that. And uh, these are big challenges. Um, by making them a you know, primitive, cheap robot uh, from the 80s, we really solved a lot of those problems. So first of all, you could look down and see a body that made sense. You know, it, it wasn't a human body that you had no control over. Uh, you, you, know, you, you kind of felt like you were a consciousness inside this robot, and it, it was easier to, to, to kind of accept that you're part of the story, that you are this character that's, that's in this world. Uh, so it's, you know, it was great for creating this rapport with the viewer. It was a great solution to, to the rendering of the body uh, problem, and it allowed a lot of the um, uh, interactivity that, that's in there. You, you know, there's an, uh, an Easter egg hunt in, in, in the experience, for example, and if, if you were just a human in a story, the interactivity would, would be slapped on. It'd be like, okay, just like this layer of code on top of the experience. It's fun maybe, but it, it's not integrated to the experience. But as a robot, that whole Easter icon is actually a part of the story. It's a, code, it's, it's, it's a program that's inside the robot's 
mind, in a sense. So, it, you know, I'm just, this is the tip of the iceberg, but it really was a facilitator uh, of a lot of um, the challenges that we've had in, in, um, in making this piece. Yeah, and it's interesting to, um, to think about how you gave the viewers a sense of progression and state in the robot, because there's this idea of, of, of degrading, or, you know, it's the systems check, and there's, there's some glitchy, glitchiness. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was, I think it was very effective because it gave someone a, a, a journey, uh, a lifelong journey while they're in it. Um, and then the other thing, of course, was that you, there's a sense of presence in a particular moment that, that I know we wanted to talk about. Um, I was really struck by it while watching it, and these are all spoilers, so apologies. But, um, but there's, a, there's a moment in which there's a, a mirrored representation of Miubi in, in a TV, old school CRT TV. Um, and you know, I sort of got lost looking at it and, and moving around a lot, um, and uh, and that was that was really clever. I'm, I would love to just hear more about how that came about. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's a, it's a small detail. It's it's literally like 40 pixels <laughs> by 40 pixels, I think. Uh, but really, since you know, since the experience is running in software, uh, you know, we had the opportunity of doing things like this, where for so to to flesh out what you were describing, there's a moment where you are being, uh, you're next to the, the father, who you also saw in the, in the trailer, uh, and he's recording a video for his son, and he's doing the video with Miyubi. And so you see the, vi the video camera, but you also see the television with the feed of, you know, the, the recording. And if you look at the TV, you, there's, there's actually a, a, a uh, the robot's head moves in accordance to your head. So it's this tiny little detail, but most people who see it, uh, it creates a real sense of, immor of immersion and belonging to this world um, because you, you don't expect it, and it, it really consolidates, um, you know, your 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 physical impact on on the scene, you know. And well, uh, it was it was. Uh, it's also the first time I think for us we have, you know, real people photo real because it's photography with a real time moment, and I think that's the it's the combination of those two things that creates that powerful moment because you're certainly used to the real time moments in game engine content, but maybe without the same visual fidelity. So I think that that was like the striking convergence. Yeah, yeah exactly. I agree. I think we we're used to seeing a, a huge amount of agency interaction in, in CG worlds yes. and in video worlds. We're very used to this kind of linear narrative that plays out, um, and so that I. I mean that is a, if you haven't seen it, it's it's a very it's a small detail, but it's worth checking out because I think it's a it's a sign of a, a direction that we're, we're we'd like to see um, a lot more experimentation. Um, and also, I think this is one of the uh, one of the only narr like narrative long form narrative experiences we've seen, and it, it has recognizable actors. Um, I, it would be really interesting to find out, uh, you know, what, what was the process like both for the actors and for your team. Um, in working in this new medium? Yeah, um, well, it was really interesting for us to work with this great cast. And, um, you know, at first, most of the actors were very curious, but also hesitant. You know, they've, they've never seen real acting in VR or didn't know how to approach it. And we hear a lot of people say, like, well, what is it, what, what's similar about acting in VR compared to theater or to film and TV? And certainly we find there's some commonalities, but really, I think they all felt it was a whole new thing. It has this, um, this sort of blocking sort of uh, dynamic from theater, but you know, in theater you have to make the performance great for someone in the first row and then in the back row, and you're projecting quite you know, loud for the back of the room. And here it had the intimacy of cinema, but you couldn't hide. You couldn't you know, be hidden by a cut. Um, everyone was always acting. You know, typically in a film, if you're shooting a conversation, as most people know, you know, you're shooting one side of the conversation at a time, and then the other person is there helping or not at all. So um, I think all the actors really enjoyed the theater-like element of being together and always acting. And even when they're not speaking, they're always acting because they're always visible to the to the camera. Um, so that's part of it. And then um, there's a lot. I mean, Paul can speak more to this, but just about how big or small you may want to be in a given moment, and just the cadence of how you're being portrayed. I mean, the one thing I would say is we've looked at uh, examples like uh, Ang Lee's uh, movie, uh, The Long Walk with Billy Lynn. I think it was uh, 120 frames a second, 4K 3D. And a lot of people said, wow, this looks too real. It doesn't feel like cinema. It doesn't have that dreamlike thing. And VR has that too. I mean, we're doing 60 frames a second or more at higher resolution. So it's not going to look and feel exactly like cinema. Um, so we're also trying to recalibrate people's 
minds for a, a brand new thing, you know, and it's, it's going to take some time to, to make people feel like, okay, this is not film, this is not theater, it's its, its own thing. Interesting. And do you have guidelines about um, the, the distances people, you know, these actors can be and then to still have, like, to be able to read an expression? Is that, is that on the actor or is it on, like, the tech side? Yeah, I mean, so you don't, you, you can't zoom in. You don't have, you don't, you, there's no telephoto. Um, and there's also limitations in resolution depending on what device you're looking at it on. And even on, on the highest end, uh, at past a certain distance, you just stop getting that, that, you stop being able to breathe that, that emotion. So, you know, we try to keep things, there's, there's really a sweet spot or a sweet zone where we try to keep, um, uh, characters, you can get pretty damn close, I think. You don't want to stay there too long, probably. Uh, so there's like this, this area where you can like kind of peek in and out of, and then there's like this sweet spot where you want to have most of your action most of the time. Um, and really the equivalent of a wide shot and a, and a, and a zoom, and a, and a, a wide shot and a close up uh, is, is, is just in the staging. So if something is further away, you're going to get that feeling you would have gotten uh, if you would have cut away in a film, except you need to build it into your your staging, you know, you, you have to kind of pre-edit, knowing that, cool, at this point, he's gonna get up and he's gonna go over there, and she's gonna move over here, and, and for example, um, you know, if, if you have a wider field of view, like an ac action that's, that's on, on parametrically opposed sides of the scene, what you're creating essentially is a quick cutting, the equivalent of quick cutting, because the viewer's gonna do this, 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 this. If they're together, you're creating a, you're, you're creating a long shot, or a mm -hmm. long take. Uh, if something's happening here for a while and then something calls your attention there, that's a cut, you know? So even though we cut very little in, in, our, in our experiences, generally speaking, uh, a scene will usually be a shot. That is still true after four years of, uh, of doing this. Uh, we, we, we rarely cut within a scene. We, we integrate the cuts in the, in, in the staging. And I think that's, um, that's something that we were very, um, uh, that we talk about a lot with the actors because it's a great way for them to understand. They, they may have never done VR, but they've seen obviously millions of films and they know the effect of a cut, the effect of a close up, the effect of a white shot. And so even though we're not doing any of these things, we're still using that vocabulary when we're working with them. Interesting, yeah. Um, and as, as someone who's behind the camera a lot, I, I often rely on things like depth of field. You know, there's something, some of these tools that are, that are no longer available or, or just being tested mm -hmm. in 360. Um, and so it seems like there's a, there's a translation process or a, a new vocabulary um, being developed. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think this is the biggest uh, change in storytelling language um, that, I, I, that I can think, I mean, especially, certainly in my lifetime. So yeah. it's, it's really exciting and it, it's a huge challenge and every project, whether it's a fiction or nonfiction piece, uh, is a constant uh, you know, learning experience. There, there's something that uh, Colm said yesterday that I think we deal with on a daily basis. We're developing a lot of projects with people from theater or film or television and I'm, I myself, I'm from film and you're from film and many other things too. But we all have baggage that we bring to the table and sort of every new conversation you have with someone who's excited about VR, typically you have to go back to zero and really start at the beginning, you know, because they probably haven't seen a lot or they have a preconceived notion of what they think they want to do or can do. And, and sometimes they break the rules like, you know, or there are no rules like Colm said, but also, um, you know, they really just need to go watch a bunch of stuff. And I think that's the biggest thing about this is you have to learn from others and we're all learning together and building off of each other. And that's, that's so critical. Right, right. Um, can we switch to some technical talk for a little bit? Um, I think uh, another thing I was struck by while watching the movie is that I, it was, I was able to forget that I was watching video and headset. And that sounds like a weird thing to say, but um, I think given the, the quality improvements over the, you know, over the years that we've been doing this, um, normally in headset when I'm looking at experiences, especially if I go back a year or two years, I am noticed that I'm watching video because there are artifacts all over the pace, place. And Miyubi is one of the first I've seen where the artifacts are so minor that, that I, almost, I, I was able to forget and just focus on the story. So I think um, we'd love to hear more, like what, how are you doing it? I mean, without, um, I don't know that all the secret sauce. There's some secret sauce in there, I know. But. I mean, it, it's obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've been working on uh, a cu custom c camera from the beginning, and this thing has been evolving on every single project. Uh, and 
we're writing software, we're, we're, we're improving our, 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 our post workflow. I think really it's about being creative, not just on the storytelling side, but on, on the technical side. Uh, I think that's where you know, my background comes from is this kind of you know, convergence of, of, of tech and, 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 and art. And uh, you don't, you know, unlike if you make a film today, you can be very creative on the film, but it's going to be shown pretty much the same way. I mean, you can be creative on the marketing, on the distribution, but it's going to be shown on a rectangular screen that it's going to be, it's going to be linear unless you do something special that's outside of the mainstream of, of cinema or television. Uh, with, with 360 video, even if it's video, whatever that means, uh, it doesn't have to just be video. And that means you can, you can do things like that little, that little uh, that, that head rotation thing. You mentioned uh, you know, splitting up your, your sphere into zones where you can, you can pack more resolution in areas and freeze others. And you can do that dynamically and be creative with that. Um, you can do all sorts of uh, interactivity layers. Uh, I think you want to be careful with that, too. You, you don't want to just put interactivity for interactivity's right. sake. Uh, and 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 you know we always try to find uh, a, an integrated reason for for doing that, uh, but you really your 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 technical um, sort of the ground on which you stand uh, to build your creative piece is also something you can play with, that you can you can kind of mold into whatever you whatever you want whatever you, oh this video could have this and 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 this this is good this uh, this affects the the quality but it also affects what kind of story you can tell. And I, I see it all kind of as one big thing, one big creative sphere uh, that includes the, the writing and, and, and the acting and the set design, but the software and the layers of inter interactivity and the way we're optimizing. Like, you know, there, there are certain scenes that can be optimized in one way, others that can be op optimized in other ways because of the nature of the scene. And so we, keep, we have that in mind while we're even making the shots. We're like, well, okay, here we're probably going to be able to achieve this level of quality knowing everything that we know. And so we can allow this, this sweet spot we were talking about of where you want to generally have a action or actors, that can go further. Because in this scene, uh, we're not moving the camera. So we could plate the hell out of it and just you know, put all the resolution of the video in a very small area. And um, this, this changes you know, what you can and can't do and, and what you, how effectively you can tell your story. So the, it's the, a lot of the custom tools that, that you've written or are using, are, are you finding, are you seeing a path where those tools are, can be av made available uh, or, or are being made available by tools vendors to, to you know, the industry? Well, you know, we, we have a lot of discussions with, with you guys, of course, and, 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 and with uh, Carmack. And, uh, you know, we, uh, I think that there's a lot of what we've been doing that you've been doing that are the, the, the results of conversations. Um, you know, we can, uh, I, I don't you know, you, you guys don't support the sort of plating we were talking about, but it's something you should and could mm -hmm. uh, eventually do. Uh, and there's all sorts of, um, you know, dynamic streaming, for example, allows for much higher resolution than, 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 we were, than, than we were able to before. However, it does have some limitations right now because of the latency and depending on your connection and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but so definitely a lot more of these things are becoming available. Um, you know, we try to, you know, when, when we talk, when we talk uh, about the platforms you guys are building, you know, th these are things we, we talk about and try to, to have you build into your, your tools as well. Um, you know, as, as great as it is to write our own so software uh, to do all these tricks, uh, not everyone can do that. And, and, and you know, we don't want to be the only ones doing this, otherwise this, <laughs> this is right. not going to go anywhere. So, um, definitely, uh, you know, but it's a give and take as well. You know, we're, we're also developing a lot of proprietary stuff. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's always about finding that right balance between uh, sharing and then keeping some of the stuff that, that gives your company value because we're also right. you know, running a business. So it's, it's always about towing that line. Uh, yeah. Are you tempted by any of the integrated cameras that have, that have come out recently? Like, what do you think about the, the quality of? They're definitely seeing? getting better. Um, yesterday, we, um, we, we shot, well, we were here, but uh, part of our team was uh, shooting the, um, the uh, uh, SpaceX rocket launch from about 10 feet of the rocket. <laughs> really? mm -hmm. uh, it would have been nice not to put one of our cameras there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did the camera come back? We, do we hear uh, it? It's, it's, it's not as <laughs> damaged as It's we not think. as bad, but it's definitely going to need to go into surgery. <laughs> 
Uh, so, uh, and, but you know, th there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, we, we build a lot of custom designs for different purposes as well, you know, like underwater shots or, or moving shots or whatever it is. Um, but, um, you know, we, you don't, we don't always need, depending on the shot, um, you don't always need the same kind of camera. And so we are looking at a lot of the cameras that are out there for different uh, specialty shots um, and, and things like that. Absolutely, yeah. And then on the, on the distribution side, we, you know, you, brushed, you talked about this very briefly about streaming and dynamic streaming and what's possible. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the, the issues with the 40 minute piece is that it's a very big download. Yeah. Uh, and especially on mobile, there can be some friction in getting everything into headset. Um, what are your thoughts or, you know, your thoughts about streaming versus local embedding and, you know, where that is now and where, where you think it's going to be? Or, you know, is there, is there a time frame, do you think, you know, that where we'll, I mean, some of it's on us. <laughs> um. uh, well, definitely streaming is the path of least resistance. Um, it's, it's, it's harder with something like Miyubi where you have all these layers of interactivity, but it's not impossible. Um, it's just, it just takes more work. Um, so we're, we're <laughs> Uh, right now, the, the best way to watch Miubi is to, is to download it. Um, I'm not even, uh, is Sebastian in the room? No, 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 I don't no. think so. Uh, I don't even know if we're, we're, our streaming uh, is switched on right now, mm -hmm. um, but um, we, we we're definitely working on it if, it if it's not out yet. But it, it is harder because, you know, you, you're, you're, um, you're basically opening kind of Pandora's box, uh, you know, having all, adding all these layers on top of something that is not local. You know, right? Um, but no, it's definitely a, it's definitely a possibility, and, and, and uh, I think ideally streaming would be the default uh, as as often as, as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I want to leave time for Q and A, mm -hmm. um, but we have a, a a really nice trailer to show. Um, do you want you want to introduce the the next project? Yeah. So that rocket launch uh, I was talking about is part of uh, this project that we're about to uh, show you the trailer for. We're actually also showing that in uh, three in, in in the in headset headsets, yeah. in um, in the air, what, what, what's called the area called the sandbox. I don't know. <laughs> the, yeah. the area where you can see VR. Um, <laughs> right. The, so the it's called name. it's called Space Explorers, and it's it's probably our most ambitious on the on the nonfiction yeah. side. Uh, definitely our most ambitious project uh, about. A year and a half in the making, and probably another six months to go to, to for it to all be done. So it's it's a series uh, on space exploration uh, that we've made in collaboration with with, with you guys, uh, um, Morgan Spurlock, and um, with the participation of NASA, SpaceX, uh, uh, Russ Cosmos, the Russian space yeah. agency. Um, it's and it's been shooting all over the world. I mean, we just got back from Kazakhstan. We've shot in the White Sand, White Sands Desert, Florida, Houston, and uh, this project started by Morgan Spurlock saying to me when I first met him, "Hey, what about bringing a VR camera to space?" And we, at, 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 when he said that, we were like, "Well, that's ridiculous, but also anything's possible in VR." It feels like right now, so it's also something that we like were excited about. And then when we talked to uh, our partners at NASA that, that he introduced us to, they said, well, why don't you guys start on Earth? Why don't you uh, think about Earth first and uh, we'll, we'll open some doors for you and uh, we'll see how that goes. So that's what we did and uh, it, they've been great uh, allies and partners and uh, we're excited for people to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, let's play it. So in the biggest picture, space exploration is our future. Because someday, we're either going to destroy the Earth or the sun is going to blow up. So our future as a human race is out there in the universe. 
Just like the early Europeans came over and discovered the Western world and so forth, it's our future to do that. The contributions we make are small steps along the way and a, a continuum you know, into the very distant future. When I got the call from Peggy Whitson, it was a very emotional call only because I never dreamed that I would have been one of the nine Americans um, that the U.S. selected that year. One of the nice things about our crew is that um, we have a common mission. And because we have this common mission, we can work together towards that goal. The differences kind of get lost. And so the common things start to stand out. And so one of the things we want to really do is understand our universe, what happened. And if we can understand what happened in our solar system, with our planet, with our moon, understanding that will help us maybe prevent things from occurring in the future. Space exploration is about opening your mind. And I think we all had this uh, desire in us from the time we were little kids is to find out what's over the next hill. We always want to go and explore. When I was a little kid, I was a little bit disappointed because I thought everything was invented. <laughs> and, you know, when I finally went to test pilot school and understand how you math model and how you come up with new aircraft or how you build a spacecraft, or even the, the possibilities beyond just building a spacecraft, but living in space and being in space and, and traveling farther in space. I, you know, there's, there's so much more to invent. Yeah, we'll walk outside. Thank you. The pace of development is picking up and the vision of getting to Mars is becoming real. And I think the next 30 years are gonna be a great chapter in the history of human space exploration. Fast forward through generations and generations and generations, we're going to have humans living on other planets within the universe because that's our future. So I, I've been told we are officially out of time. Um, but if, if you have a few minutes, we'll, we'll just step out into the hallway, and uh, we'll have an informal Q&A out there. So thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.